The safety and health monitoring is a very important function of a BMS in PHEV systems. Well, for example, the discharge limit is determined by the lowest cell, where the charge limit is determined by the highest cell if the balancing system is not in place. The temperature, temperature is another factor that affects the whole operating uh, system and affects the decision process. SOC voltage, temperature, and they are all working together to determine the available capacity. And the diagram shown here is a converted Chrysler S-band PHEV just for uh, evaluation and testing purpose. There are a number of other, other special control issues in PHEV power systems. Uh, power management is a critical issue for PHEV optimization. Because with optimization, with good power management and vehicle control, you can maximize the electric energy use in different driving profiles. For example, a PHEV 30 serves very well for somebody who drives 30 miles on daily commuting. But how about somebody if uh, who drives 20 miles daily. That PHEV 30 ap apparently has 10 miles uh, electrical energy that he does not use on a daily basis. So the vehicle should be redesigned to fit his needs. Similarly, if somebody who drives 40 miles on a daily commuting, he needs 10 more miles. On a REEV basis, you can easily design the battery pack in different sizes 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50 to satisfy different customer needs. But on blended PHEV, it is very hard to do because the equivalent electrical driving range is not realized in the first 20, 30, or 40 miles. It is realized in a maybe a, a, com a combined or blended operation conditions. So for a blended PHEV, again, look at PHEV 20. What it means that is this vehicle has an equivalent 20 miles electrical range. That's what PHEV 20 means. However, that 20 miles electrical range cannot be realized in the first 20 miles. You probably can realize that in the first 40 miles driving range, or 50 miles driving range, or 30 miles driving range. Therefore, it will really depend, it will really depend on the driving um, profile of that driver, how this system needs to be designed. Uh, we discussed already in the earlier lectures that you could design a 150 mile MPG car, but if that MPG only lasts for five or 10 miles, that does not help very much to displace fuel usage. On the other hand, if you design a 30 MPG car that can be driven 100 miles on that MPG and then it drop, that may also make any, diff, uh, may, uh, any sense for somebody if he only drives 40 or 50 miles on a daily commuting. So there's a lot of factors need to be considered in that design process. And the basic optimization can be done in a different way. A second uh, special subject in the PHEV is a V2G concept. A V2G, we talked many times already. What it is, it's an a, it, a inter interface between a power grid and the vehicle, and it enables bidirectional energy flow. At the meantime, you may also have a bidirectional energy flow, where you will have a smart charging system on the car to communicate with the utility company, either through the power lines or through a wireless communications. And that will provide opportunities to do timely charge, to do um, uh, price differentiated charging for the vehicle, and possibly using your vehicle to offset uh, the power grid power demand and to provide friction regulation, voltage regulation, and st stability control for the power grid. So there's a lot of good things can be done with a V2G concept. In order to do that V2G concept, we have to uh, make sure that what is input. If you're connecting at 110, 15 amps, you can do 1.5 kilowatts charge. For a 12 kilowatt hour pack, you need roughly eight hours of charging time. Would that be enough? If somebody starts at middle night and his car is not charged by 6 a.m., so that's, 
that may not work for many people. Therefore, you may have to build a dedicated charging port, uh, say 110 volts, 50 amps, and then you can charge at 5 kilowatts for, uh, uh, again, 12 kilowatt hour pack. It only takes 2.5 hours for charging time. Alternatively, you may be able to build a 220 volts outlet at 30 amps, and you can increase from 5 to 6 kilowatts. If what happens, 1 million PHEV is on the road. If they are all plugged in at the same time or around the same time, you are creating a huge inrush. If every vehicle is charging at 6 kilowatts, you are at 6,000 megawatts. 6,000 megawatts. That's huge power inrush. So you really don't want that to happen at the, everybody charging at the, exactly at the middle night. So the smart charging device would put some vehicles in uh, the, earlier than others. And with all this 6,000 megawatts power, you're going to need three power plants, three new power plants, if they are added to the current capacity. Now, if you are taking advantage of the middle night uh, off-peak, that's why you don't need to build new plants. If we look further, if we have 25% penetration of PHEV, in the US, we have 240 million cars on the road. 240. 25% will equal to 60 million cars. If we have 25% penetration, like uh, what the president wanted to happen in a number of years, we are going to need 160 new power plants. That's what we're going to need. The current off-peak capacity will not be sufficient. So that's something the nation has to uh, deal with in the long run. In the vehicle to grid, as we said, charging after 10 p.m. Um, at a low level, there's no problem. You don't need additional power generation. But at a high charging rate, eight additional power plants will be needed for one million vehicles if you charge at six kilowatts. For smart charging, it uh, can potentially reduce the infrastructure current and the impact on the vehicle systems. This diagram shows where you can charge the vehicle at off-peak and, in fact, you can use the battery power uh, during uh, peak time to offset the grid power demand. In that case, uh, this uh, will be done uh, in, by the utility company with the differentiated pricing. For example, they're going to charge you 3 cents at night time when you charge the car, but they're going to pay you 11 cents during the day when you provide the power to the power grid. So this the something that can be done to give consumers some incentive to, to do that, to help the utility to uh, stabilize their power system. In the impact, we already talked about it. Um, so if there's no smart charging, the EV owners will go home and plug in the vehicle they're going to charge. So everybody start to charge at 6 p.m. will have trouble. We're going to need a lot, a lot of new plants. So that's where V2G makes, uh, makes uh, good sense. Uh, Google is actually also working in this area. They're writing a software uh, using the vehicle dispatch algorithm where they can uh, put vehicles into the grid at the different times based on priorities. So. Uh, there's uh, uh, things can be done to, uh, to mi mitigate uh, the congestion due to uh, a lot of penetration of PHEVs. On the other hand, we also have to be careful about safety and reliability of PHEV operations. In a no normal operation, the charging with one, 1772, it's a uh, conductive charger. The plug-in uh, has to be done carefully. For example, minor, minus uh, kids shouldn't touch that, and so on. In charge stations, how do you make sure that it is protected from rain, snow, and so on? In those days, you have to make sure it is safe. Uh, during accidents, safety has to be dealt with. The battery itself, uh, in an OEM car, it's likely not going to be in the crash zone, so therefore um, the rear end crash or head-on crash may not create um, an immediate, let's say, explosion for the kite itself, but the high-voltage system and uh, 
the crash itself may form a short circuit, so the batteries also need to be protected somehow. For example, a safe disconnect and early warning for the battery if there's any potential failure is very important for the driver to know. So this things that we need to do. So now let's move on to look at the current and planned OEM PHEV. Um, as uh, you will see from the next slide, there are almost every OEM uh, is involved in PHEV development. Now we don't have all the information of every PHEV is being developed, but even if we have, we not, will not have enough time to cover every PHEV. So we'll pick five uh, PHEVs over here to discuss their design and their operation. Again, this is when you can see that uh, this almost involves every manufacturer of vehicles from the US to Japan to China and uh, to Europe. First one, we look at the Toyota Prius PHEV. The Toyota Prius PHEV have two origins, okay? This one right now they're working on and they claim to be released very soon. They're using the current PHEV by adding an extra nickel metal hydride battery pack, identical pack to the original pack to increase the power from 1.3 kilowatt hour to 2.5 kilowatt hour, which will give you about five miles of driving range. So that one, it is a plug-in when they change the vehicle control so that you can take advantage of two battery packs in parallel. However, however, it may not give you a huge advantage because it only provides you limited driving range. Toyota's target is to have one million hybrid uh, manufactured and sold by, uh, uh, by uh, themselves. And they're going to uh, have every vehicle to be a hybrid by 2020. That's a very ambitious goal, but it is very possible by the way that they work right now. There's a second version of uh, uh, Toyota PHEV, Toyota Prius PHEV. Uh, so this is the one that I already discussed. It has a nickel metal hydride battery, and it provides uh, roughly uh, five to uh, seven uh, miles driving range. The charging takes uh, 1.5 to two hours. Toyota did some testing in Europe, and they found that 50% of efficiency improvement uh, for field trips, uh, for trips up to 25 uh, kilometers. 80% of the daily trips are actually under 25 miles for their test uh, drive in Europe. This diagram shows the distribution between efficiency and the distance driven um, per trip. As I mentioned, there's actually another uh, PHEV under development, which the details have not been disclosed to the public, public yet, but Toyota is working diligently behind the scene on their lithium ion based uh, previous PHEV. But we'll see what happens in the next uh, year or so, they're going to come out. The second PHEV, which has been very hot in the, uh, in the public media, is the uh, Chevy Volt uh, by GM. They call this uh, REEV or EREV. It is a range extended electrical vehicle. It is a series configuration, which means they have a motor that directly drives the vehicle, and then they have an onboard engine and a generator to develop electricity. It is a purely electrically driven system. Um, you can see that this is the layout of the vehicle system, and the specs of the system included a 16 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack. It's going to be made by CPI, Compact Power Inc., um, with the batteries provided by LG. And GM has actually announced that they're going to build their own assembly plant to make the battery packs for themselves. The battery can provide 140 kilowatts of power at any uh, given moment when they are fully charged. It can be recharged at 110 outlet uh, by 6 to 6.5 hours. The motor is an induction motor that can provide 120 kilowatts of power. Uh, the continuous electric, 45 kilowatts, continuous mechanical, 40 kilowatts. The engine is a three-cylinder turbo charger engine, one liter, 160 horsepower, 120 kilowatts. The electrical range is uh, predicted at 40 miles. In fact, uh, because it has a 16 kilowatt hour pack, 
at the beginning, when you buy the vehicle, it will probably provide more than 40 miles range. But that 40 miles is more towards the end of the vehicle life. You can still get roughly 40 miles range. The estimated fuel economy um, is uh, 50 miles per gallon during charge sustaining operation. For the first 40 miles or less, there's no MPG because it doesn't start the engine. Uh, if you go to 60 miles, combined with the first 40 miles, if you calculate the fuel consumption and total miles, you can get 150 MPG. For 80 miles, you can get 80 M, uh, 100 MPG. Acceleration is 0 to uh, 60 miles. Uh, is 8 to 8.5 seconds, top speed 120 miles. Okay. A third PHEV is also by GM. That's a setting wheel two-mode two hybrid. Now this is a blended PHEV, which uh, was supposed to come out this year, but due to the economy situation, due to the reorganization of GM, so this model is is temporarily delayed, and the, the date that this is going to come out is unknown. But this is a blended PHEV that has a 50 kilowatts motor that can be used to drive the vehicle, and the battery packs, uh, the size is unknown at the moment, but the idea is to give you 15 to 25 miles range based on the size of battery selected for the vehicle. Uh, but that 15 to 25 miles electrical range, again, is not realized within the first 15 to 20 miles, but it's realized within, let's say, maybe 30 to 40 or 50 miles range. Ford also developed a PHEV based on their Ford Escape hybrid. Uh, their hy their, uh, this Ford Escape hybrid has a um, motor that is a... Uh, 50 kilo, uh, 75 kilowatts. They have produced 21 of these PHEVs so far and did some fleet testing with Southern California Edison and some uh, uh, companies. The battery is a 10 kilowatt hour pack. It, it is enough for 30 miles electrical driving on this uh, small SUV. So if you calculate the fuel economy, because also it is a blended PHEV, you are not going to get um, a pure electrical driving range right away, so you're going to get equivalent electrical driving range. The fuel economy can get up to 120 miles per gallon, depends on how you calculate the MPG, depends on how many miles that you're going to look at. But overall, the equivalent electrical driving range is 30 miles. The next uh, hybrid is the Chrysler Town Country Mini one, which is also under development by Chrysler. It is also a blended PHEV, a two-motor hybrid uh, with a large battery pack. The powertrain is the same as the conventional HEV. It has 11 kilowatt hour battery pack. Uh, it can achieve 53 miles per gallon in its first 50 miles driving. So the equivalent miles uh, electrical range is roughly 22 miles. The total range will be 700 miles with all the gasoline consumed. The towing capacity is going to achieve 1,000 pounds. And uh, so far, this is only mini one PHEV being developed. Now, it's not ready yet. It's, it's uh, being developed. The diagram that you see, the bottom is a prototype for testing and characterization, and the top is uh, how the vehicle appears. So those are the OEM PHEVs that I want to discuss. In addition to those, you're looking at the BMW, Nissan, uh, Honda, uh, B, uh, in China, the BYD, Cherry, they're all working or already have a prototype model available in the PHEV space. They are still conducting extensive testing and um, uh, characterizations. So those vehicles may not be available right away to the consumer, but in the immediate future, like this year, later this year, and early next year, you will, have, you will expect some OEM PHEVs available, and then later next year and early the year after, you will see more PHEVs available in the marketplace. But at the meantime, since there's no OEM PHEV available for consumers, they're hoping after market, PHEV conversion companies that provide PHEVs, 
It either help you to do the converting or they sell you the converted PHEV from conventional EV. A number of companies are involved in this work. I'm going to introduce five of these companies here. One Power Solutions Hybrids Plus, A123 High Motion, Energy CS, and, uh, and the last one is the Prius Converging Kits that is public available uh, in the, on the internet. One Power Solution is a small company, startup company, that help uh, develop uh, PHEVs based on current HEV. They have developed uh, four different types of, uh, of uh, PHEV. Uh, including the Prius, uh, the Chrysler uh, S-Ban, the Chrysler Mini One, and the Saturn Wheel. And then this, this Saturn Wheel is not OEM Saturn Wheel PHG, but it's converted by one power. You can see with all the uh, different energy rating for the battery pack, the ranges are also a little different. The Prius PHV with a 7 kilowatt hour, kilowatt hour pack, the equivalent range approaches roughly 30 miles with the Chrysler S-Ban 11 kilowatt hour pack, uh, equivalent E-range is roughly 21 miles. With the Mini One, same battery pack, roughly 25 miles, with the center wheel uh, working underway with a 10 kilowatt hour pack, equivalent estimated of, um, predicted range is roughly 30 miles. Hybrids Plus is a company based uh, on uh, Colorado, and then they do uh, two type of converging One's the Prius, another one is, uh, uh, is uh, the Escape. They have their own, they have the, they have their own um, proprietary BMS that replaces the Prius BMS and the battery. They use A13 26650 lithium ion battery, 9 kilowatt hour. So what they do they is they remove the original battery and the battery controller. They put the new battery in the system. You, you can see on the diagram on the right, this is the original battery pack before uh, in front of the spare tire. Well, Hybrids Plus has designed a L-type battery pack that will still uh, help you to, uh, with, the re, uh, with the availability of, the, of accessing the spare tire. So the batteries, because they are cylindrical, smaller cells, they have more than 1,000 battery cells put together to form the pack. The, two, uh, the Prius 15 and the Prius 30 each provide 50 miles and 30 miles range. Uh, the total range is uh, 25 and uh, 50 miles uh, range, which means within that range, you're going to get a much higher MPG. Um, up to 100 mpg. The mass, because it increased battery, increased uh, 30 to 70 kilograms, depends on which battery pack uh, you, um, you want to replace. They have their charger, their own charger, uh, their BMS, and their controller. So their charger would charge from uh, 110 volts AC 15 amps, uh, roughly five to nine hours charging. And uh, their controller, uh, BMS, interacts with the vehicle controller, which will replace all the battery uh, controller car messages uh, floating on the bus. However, last year there is an accident that due to some failed connection, the loose connection that caused spark and which eventually caused the fire of a Prius. So right now, they no longer offer this uh, Prius PHEV converting. However, they are still offering the Prius, uh, the Hybrid Plus is Escape hybrid converging. The Escape converging can reach uh, 25 miles uh, equivalent electrical range. It is a blending mode up to 50 miles, which means beyond 50 miles, it will go back to normal HUV operation, normal HUV uh, fuel economy. The energy, uh, in the battery pack is 13.3 kilowatt hour. Uh, additional weight is 56 kilograms. They remove the original pack and put this new pack with their own charger, their BMS, and a controller. So this is available. You can actually order online, and they will do the converging for you. 
The sale that they use is the same one they used in the previous. It's 26650 from A123. And again, it's charging from uh, 115 volts AC input up to nine hours charging time. A third company that does the conversion is A123 itself. There's a company called High Motion. A year ago, A123 bought High Motion, so now it's called A123 High Motion. They provide you with a five kilowatt hour battery pack in addition to the original batteries. Well, so what they're doing is that they're not touching the original vehicle battery and the battery controller. They're only adding this five kilowatt hour pack uh, to the original battery pack, so you, will, you see, so you will have more energy available. You can order five kilowatts, or you can order two. That will be ten kilowatt hour. So this uh, battery is a different battery. They were so-called nano phosphate uh, lithium ion cells, five kilowatts, five point five hour charging time. It's uh, one hundred eighty pounds. It is in place of the spare tire. So which means when you put this in, you have to remove spare tire, and then you put this battery in, and it will give you uh, roughly um, 10 miles driving range. They are suggested uh, sale price, retail price is uh, 10,395 plus tax with three years warranty on the parts. So this is how it looks when you put the batteries uh, in the original spare tire where the original spare tire is located. Energy CS is a company actually earlier involved in PHEV conversion. Uh, they use Wilens 18650 cells, uh, nine, kilo, 9 kilowatt hour pack with uh, also a certain equivalent electrical driving range for the vehicle. In order to uh, convert a HUV to a PHUV, there are two methods you already look at. One is to keep the existing battery pack by adding additional battery to the original pack, so you have more power. The original battery and the battery controller are not touched. So the system is much safe, uh, much safer to operate, but the problem is that you're not take full advantage of the add-on battery pack. Another method is to replace the existing battery pack. So take out the battery, take out the controller, put a new battery, put a new controller. There's more risk in this conversion because if there's anything in the new battery controller that does not match the vehicle, the original uh, vehicle battery controller, you may have trouble uh, to put the battery in a fault condition. So therefore, converting in this type uh, needs a lot more uh, care needs. But both systems, the second converting process will give you the freedom to take advantage of the new pack. You can basically uh, change all the information the battery controller is supposed to be, such as charge limit, discharge limit, um, uh, SOC, so that the vehicle system will take advantage of it. But in the, uh, if you keep the existing pack, since you are not touching the battery controller, it's very difficult to manipulate information on the CAN bus, therefore the vehicle controller does not take a whole advantage of the add-on battery pack. So to keep the existing pack, the way is uh, to add uh, additional battery uh, pack. Uh, for example, in the Prius, you would put the battery pack uh, behind the original battery pack and in place of the original spare tire. When you put this battery pack there, you have to constantly release energy from the add-on pack to the existing pack so that the vehicle will use the energy. So therefore, you may need a DC-DC converter in order to do that purpose. If you simply put the original pack and the new pack in parallel, it may not give you, again, the full advantage uh, to realize the kind of equivalent electrical driving range. The converting of previous HUV into a PHUV is very popular. There have been many companies doing that. Also, um, hobby uh, is to doing that. Uh, they are uh, they are doing this on their hobby. They're doing it on their own. So on the internet, you can find the converging diagram that it tells you exactly what to do and how to do it. So this diagram is downloaded from 
uh, internet, and you can find this by Googling Prius uh, PHEV conversion. On this diagram, the portion of the diagram is the original OEM parts, and then the other portion are replaced by the new battery uh, system, including the battery pack or may include your new battery controller. In some other aftermarket conversion, they only replace the battery pack, but don't replace the battery controller, the battery ECU. By keeping the battery ECU, the good thing is that the battery ECU will produce all the information needed for the vehicle controller, so there's no risk of uh, not getting a car running. But the issue is, by keeping the existing battery ECU, you are not able to manipulate a lot of the information. Or even if you can, but the CAN bus will have two different information flowing around. So you will have trouble uh, getting the system in a constant and a stable operating condition. When you remove the existing pack, the new pack, new pack and the new battery controller needs to match exactly the original battery ECU information, whether it's input or output. So all, all CAM messages has to be identical. Otherwise, the vehicle will enter into a fault condition. This is the terminal that connects the battery ECU to the vehicle controller. And then you can see there are uh, eight, there are eight, uh, there are nine actually different pins that we have to identify. The can, uh, can high, can low. There's a 12 volts power supply. There's a fan control, and then there's a 12 volts ready. And there's 12 volts um, always on. There's a also ignition indication. Uh, so this information can be used by your new battery controller, and your new battery controller has to send out uh, corresponding kind of messages um, to the vehicle controller so that vehicle controller will know the vehicle condition and then it can uh, start it to run the vehicle. For example, this chart shows the start sequence of the Prius. When you start the vehicle, uh, the K1 will give out a short pulse and then, and then it will test whether uh, there's a short circuit. So the K1, uh, K1, sorry, the K1 is a, uh, is a relay number one. So they're going to um, close relay number uh, num uh, number one uh, to s to see whether there's any any um, short fault in the circuit. If there is none, then they will close K3 at after 235 milliseconds, and then they're going to close they're going to close K2 after another uh, short term. And then this time they're pre-charging uh, the power electronics because when you switch on the vehicle, the battery is at a high voltage, but the power electronics, the DC link will, uh, will have uh, um, zero or very low voltage. If you switch the battery on right away between the power electronics and the battery, you will have a very large inrush current. So the pre-charged circuit is going to have a resistor in series with the, uh, with the relay. So when you close the relay, the current is limited. When the DC bus voltage reaches approximately the same as the battery voltage, you close another relay that is K2. Okay, once K2 is closed, the whole system is powered up. And then the vehicle, after another 40 microseconds, the vehicle is all good to go. If during, before closing any of the relays, if anything fault is, is happening, it will not, will not start the vehicle. So the battery controller needs to wait for the vehicle ready ignition, ready signals before it closes any relays. So this is how it works in the startup. In shutting down the vehicle, it's just opposite procedure. For example, it will, the vehicle uh, ignition signal will disappear, and then the ready signal will disappear, and then the K3 will be um, at a lower voltage, then you're going to uh, close, um, you're going to open K2 uh, at first, and then you open K3. So at that moment, the whole vehicle is shutting down. The diagram 
And the procedures that I described in the early slides are available on the website. I give here, you can basically go online and download and do the conversion if you have an interest to do it on your own. Or you can ask uh, uh, companies to do the conversion for you and you pay a fee. The, the companies that are involved in this conversion process uh, are more than 10 companies. They're all listed here. So that basically covers the very basics of PHEV and HEV. The, apparently a lot of contents are recovered, uh, including the components, the design, the systems, uh, the, uh, the batteries, the management system, the control, and the converging and the OEM manufacturing of PHEV, V2G, and so on. So at this moment, I want just to continue for the next 25 minutes to discuss another topic, which is uh, the dynamics of a power split ECVT. We touched this topic a little bit at earlier, and I mentioned that time I want to discuss the details of the two-mode hybrid, how it operates at this moment. At an earlier time, when we discussed previous HEV operation, we only focused on the steady state operation, and we even neglected all the, the inertia, and we neglected it we neglected all the losses in the gear systems. In fact, in the planetary gear operation, each gear will have its inertia, and all the rotating components, whether it's the driving shaft, whether it's the axle, or whether it's the motor shaft, they all will have inertia. With that inertia in place, the relationship is not uh, the, the, the kind of uh, one that we've seen in steady state. So we just want to take a little bit look at there's three different type of electrical CVT operations, the Prius, the Camry, and the two-mode hybrid, and then see how it operates. This is a simplified diagram of the Toyota Prius planetary gear system. This is the one the same as we discussed before, but this is a simili simplified drawing to calculate the dynamics. In this diagram, it is a front wheel drive, so connected with the wheels are the final drive. You, you can see on the final drive, there's the final drive driving the axle, so the axle would have omega speed, amp is the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the J is the inertia, M is, uh, what is N? And the, the gear ratio between final drive and, um, and the wheels can be described as G, a to R, so axle to um, ring gear. So final drive to ring gear is, is hard linked with gears. So the final drive also have omega, M, and J. The ring gear has is also um, omega, M, and J of its own, the speed, uh, inertia, and so on. And S, sun gear, uh, carrier, so each of them will have it. The MG will have its own set of G, M, and Omega, and ICE will have its own uh, Omega, M, and J, and uh, the uh, motor generator one is the, the, the generator that also has its own. The gear ratio between each gear is named in the convention like a GR to S means uh, gear ratio from rain to sun. GE to S means uh, gear ratio engine to sun. So that's how it operates. By this convention, we can write down that the final drive inertia is calculated by using the axle inertia plus the final driving shaft. The, the final driving shaft itself has inertia. The axle inertia is converted to final drive because it's a gear ratio. When the speed reduction, the inertia is also reduced over here. The motor shaft will have motor shaft itself. So GM is a motor shaft inertia. GMOT is the motor itself, plus the ring gear, because motor is connected to ring gear, plus final drive, because final drive is also connected to ring gear, and plus trans transport from sun gear and generator. So sun gear and generator on the same shaft, they have inertia, they're transferred to the motor shaft. So the motor shaft has the final drive, has the ring gear, has the transport, sun gear, and generator inertia. So you can see this is the jam. On the generator shaft, 
you will have the generator shaft inertia itself plus the sun gear inertia. So that's the generator shaft. On the engine shaft, you will have the cranking shaft itself, you will have the carrier, and then you will have transport inertia from the generator shaft, because this is the planetary gear. So generator shaft inertia is also transferred to the carrier. So this is the set of inertia calculations. G is the gear ratio. And S stands for axle, C, carrier. G is generator, sun is sun, S is sun gear, R is ring gear, MOT is motor. Once you have those gear ratios um, uh, calculated, which is shown here, union to sun is a gear ratio, GE to sun, K plus one, and ring to sun is called minus K. And th this convention is a little bit different from what we used before, but it's okay. It's just how do you calculate the gear ratio. The generator speed would be uh, engine speed plus ring gear speed. Well, because we use the gear ratio as negative. If gear ratio is positive, then the engine speed uh, would minus ring gear speed will equal to engine speed. Again, each one of them will have a gear ratio. So these gear ratios basically in the past, we have, let's write down this one. We said the carrier speed is ring gear speed plus sun gear speed each times a gear ratio. So in this expression, if you write down omega g, which is a generator, which is a sun gear, so omega g is equal to omega s. That is going to equal to nr plus ns divided by ns times omega c minus nr divided by ns times omega r. So you can easily identify what is k. So k is equal to nr plus an S. Okay. Once you have this, this equation, this equation here can be written as omega g is equal to k plus one times omega c, which is the engine speed, plus k times omega r. So this is how we get this set of equations from the planetary gear systems. Those are the three gear ratios. Now, how about the engine speed? The engine speed is coupled and it can be calculated by using this, by, by reversing that, uh, that, that expression, which means it's going to be uh, omega g divided by 1 plus k minus k um, divided by 1 plus k times omega r. So you can derive any speed on these three shafts. Omega C, omega G, omega R, they are basically the same thing. By the way, omega R is the same speed as omega M. So you have all these three speeds available. With all these, these three speeds available, uh, you can now transfer the inertia in the system. So JGC, uh, generator to carrier, is generator itself plus sun gear, and then times those two gear ratios. So the equivalent inertia will be the JE engine plus JG prime. That's the equivalent inertia on the carrier. And the, the MQ is a, uh, is the inertia on the motor shaft, which is also connected to the final drive, and the ring gear is the motor inertia plus uh, G squared times J prime G. So you get this set of inertia. Now you can write down the uh, speed relationships of the system, speed and torque relationships. So if you look at the generator torque, which is going to be union torque minus uh, the inertias uh, of those two systems, the uh, omega E and omega M. So that's derivative of speed times inertia gives you the inertia, uh, inertia torque. The ring gear will have uh, motor torque plus union torque and then plus a uh, number of inertia terms. And the road resistance is basically the street resistance plus uh, 
MA. MA is acceleration. So in this case, if we write down all these equations to simplify them, you would have said that the road load can be translated by three resistance, ruling resistance plus aerodynamic resistance plus gravitational resistance, then plus MA. So that's the load, road load. That road load has to be balanced by torque on the final drive. So the final drive is TR. When you have inertia terms, all those torques are not going to be the same. But when you have interned into a steady state operation, you can eliminate all the inertia terms. Therefore, you will see that TG, generated torque, is proportional to union torque divided by GE2S. And that's the one that we derived earlier based on um, the other convention that we use. You can derive the ring gear torque, which is on the final drive, ring gear. So that's motor torque plus a portion of union torque. In this case, they used uh, this um, minus sign just to get the conventions right, times GR2S divided by GE2S. So that's how you get this uh, ring gear, which is torque. So, and again, the ring gear torque has to be same as a load torque. So this is how you calculate uh, the, in the steady state. The steady state torque relationship, as I wrote over there, you already have it. So the second one is the Ford Escape and the Mercury Mariner Hybrid. So the Escape and Mariner Hybrid, those two hybrids are the same. They are also very similar to the previous hybrid, with the difference that the motor is not directly connected to the ring gear, but through a, another gear. So if you look at the diagram, the difference is really before the final drive and after the ring gear. In the Mariner, the ring gear is directly connected to N3, MG2 is connected to N1, but N2 is connected to final drive. This is a simplified gear joint. You already saw this earlier in the uh, in other uh, part of the lecture. So the ring gear part will be eventually the same, but the inertia part, the inertia on the final drive and the ring gear part are going to be different. So that, this is the only place that you're going to find the difference. Therefore, the derivation will be much simpler because we don't have to worry about the other parts. So the gear ratio at final drive is going to be uh, the four gears. Okay, The gear, if you look at back again, N1 between N1 and N2, between N2 and N3, okay, and then between MG2 and R1, uh, and R and N3. So those are the relationships. The shift inertia can be also calculated.